welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much for your invitation. I know that your your time is is very precious. You're very much in demand these days, and I've been telling my colleagues that I'm having you today, and everyone were really thrilled. As you know, we I'm a big fan, <laughs> so thank you again. Rama, you're one of these rare people who I think in your professional career you spend probably as significant amount of time in the public and in the private sector. Do you see that as two sides of the same coin or have they been very different experiences? I mean, they are different experiences. Even though unique close partnership, collaboration between the public sector and the private sector. And in fact, not only I've worked in the public sector, but also in the private sector, but equally internationally. You know, I have advised the government in Africa and elsewhere. I think the main reason, and I spend a lot of time telling that to my friends in the private sector, it's the objective are different, you know? Now, okay, today you hear about ESG, but for a long time, it was about maximizing profit, giving the best dividend to your shareholder and trying to capture market share, if you know what I mean. But this is not the objective of government. The objective of government is basically to have happiness, to make sure that there's growth, that this growth is fairly shared, it is inclusive, and you also broaden the circle of opportunities. So I always tell people, you know, you advocate or you make lobby from a different perspective, from a different angle. And then you need to try to find common ground. And very often this common ground is what I would call second best solution because you will never get what you want. And, and especially when the interests are perceived to be clashing. And very often I tell friends, you're absolutely right to advocate for your interests. But very often your private interests or your corporate interests are not necessarily the national interest. But everybody would like you to believe that their interests you know, coincide with national interests. It's not always the case. The challenge you face when you have policy trade-off, and this can be very expensive. Okay? So, so I think their objectives are different. Comme on dit en français, la finalité est différente. And you need to find common ground to pursue the same objective, which is basically growth is important, but inclusion, you know, sharing. And now, very important is basically sustainability, resilience, and broadening the circle of opportunities for people. Do you have a personal preference for one or the other? Or you felt that each, you learned enough from each of them that they fulfilled you in their own ways? Look, I've worked in government only for 10 years when I was minister. Otherwise, I've spent my career in the private sector, albeit some of them are outside Mauritius. But I've experienced enough to realize that you don't always get what you want. And life is different there. And, and, and very often, my friend in the private sector asks me to sit in committee precisely to have this balanced view, <laughs> you know, about what might be acceptable and what might be feasible and where you do not cross the red line. I mean, let me tell you an anecdote. You know, when I was minister and when people would go and see the prime minister, he said, look, if you can't convince the Minister of Finance, don't bother. Don't come and see me. However, if you persuaded him, doesn't mean that we're going to accept. <laughs> so, so you can see that yeah. even among ministers, you know, depending on your background, on where you come from, you will have some preferences and certain things you will push as strongly as others. So it's not, I think, one way traffic. And it's good that it's like that. You will always have discussion, you will always have debate. I mean, you see it currently, you know, on immigration, you know. It's not as easy as the private sector would want us to believe. Now, I can see the perspective, but the government will say, look, that might create some problem for our low-skilled people. It might make them more difficult, probably, to have a higher wage or better conditions because there's more competition. So. I think it's a different perspective, it's different expectation, and they report to different shareholders also. Of course. <laughs> one is a very narrow base, the other one is a very big base. I mean, look what happened in the UK this week. It's precisely 
because politically they were in deep trouble with the opinion polls that they had to make a U-turn within 12 hours. Which is amazing because on the Sunday, Liz Truss said that there was no way they were going to have a U-turn on Monday morning. Opinion polls matter. Mm. When you are in government and an opinion poll come that you are losing by 30 points, that's a hell of a lot. And the pressure from conservative MPs who are in marginal seats, not even marginal seats, was tough. So, so I think they report to different shareholders. And I spend a lot of time telling my friend in the private sector, they have a different perspective. They have a different objective. They report to a different set of shareholders. There could be alignment, but at times, you know, there could be opposition in the different position. So it's different. And the easiest part is to be a consultant outside Mauritius. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> you only give advice. If they take the advice, good. If they don't take the advice, then you tell them, I told you so. Yes, and, yeah. the, and the book doesn't stop with you. And actually, that's a nice introduction to, to my next topic, which is the IFC. I think it's not an understatement to say that you're one of the founding fathers, if I may call it like that, of the IFC. You were finance minister in 1991 when the sector was just emerging. I think when you look back at the last three decades or so, particularly in the last, I would say, decade, all the ups and downs that we've had, you, you're very familiar with them. Do you think, still think that that sector has potential or do you think we're kind of running out of options now? I mean, Joanne, we are celebrating our 30th years of global business. We've come a long way. And we have significant achievements, you know, in terms of contribution to GDP, to growth, to corporate taxes, good jobs, balance of payment, significant. I don't know whether people realize my friend in the tourism sector won't be very happy. Probably global business contribute more to the balance of payment and than tourism. tourism, okay? But tourism obviously generate more jobs, you know, which I understand, and there's probably higher multiplier effect. But had it not been for global business, the balance of payment would have recorded significant deficit year in, year out, and the dollar would probably have been 60 rupees. You know, so there's been significant contribution. And for the last decades, as you said, you know, there have been significant ups and downs. The modification to the treaty uh, with India, the introduction of substance requirement, and last but not least, you know, we were on the gray list of the FATF and the black list of the EU. Mm -hmm. So now government has introduced, you know, some new products, you know, and uh, we've come out of this gray list. And I think there's an opportunity to rethink about the business model for global business and where we want to be and where we want to position ourselves. To answer your question, I think global business is still relevant to Mauritius. It's not very clear to me whether we can double the size of the contribution to GDP and increase substantially employment and also tax revenue because we have an acute shortage of, uh, of people. So my apprehension is whether the ecosystem and the business model that has taken us from where we were 30 years ago to today will enable us to run the next development lap. And I'm not sure about that. Because if you look at the mix of the business, it has not changed significantly. It's essentially cross-border investment yeah. using different structures and SPVs. And on the back of that, you have the corporate banking and a very little bit of wealth management and private banking. So, so I think there are probably three challenges. And I've been speaking about this for some time. One is how do we diversify and transform the mix of what we offer? Because what we have is basically footloose. Anybody can emulate that and do it. And we can see what's happening. Of course. And we've not been doing that, unfortunately. You know, how do we move up market, add more value, add more substance to what we've been doing, except for what I just mentioned, cross-border investment. So I think this is the first question that we have to ask ourselves. 
where will the future growth of the industry come from? Is it from the same two or three products that we have had for the last 30 years? Or we need to reinvent the model in order to continue the progress and development of that particular sector. So this is one. Second is competition. Competition is very tough. You know, two or three years ago, and again, that's the advantage of having both in the public sector and the private sector. I was telling my friends in the private sector, watch Gift City. Now, everybody was telling me, you know, this is India, the bureaucracy, you know, is so big, it's not going to happen. I said, look, remember, this is the state of the prime minister. is business oriented. And plus, they can put a lot of pressure on corporate entities to go there. They have improved significantly the ecosystem. The tax regime is probably as good, if not better, than Mauritius. The ecosystem is very well. And they have been able to create synergies among the different aspects you know, of global business, you know, in terms of debt, insurance, you call it stock exchange and whatnot. And today, many of the funds are using GIF instead of Mauritius or Singapore. Even Singapore, so they're even yes. competing with Singapore. Well, for the simple reason that this is the scale, the scope, and the authority in India are going to nudge them. Whether you call it moral suasion, or you need me somewhere else, you know, so you need to help me to build and develop that IFC. And as you are aware, in that business, there are two types of promoters of fun that are investing in India. There are those that are promoted by the Indian themselves. Then they need a portion of the fund that come from outside, and this is where they use Mauritius or Singapore. Second, there are investors outside India that also pull up. They pull their funds and they invest in India. The first one, I think, is going to come under a lot of pressure. In Africa, it's starting now. I mean, you know the case of Rwanda as well as I do. So I think it will take some time, you know, for Rwanda to compete with Mauritius. But, you know, I was teasing someone in the financial services sector the other day. I say, they don't have substance, but they're very smart at communicating. Their we've PR got... <laughs> is excellent. <laughs> they're on LinkedIn. Yeah, <laughs> very we've got good products <laughs> and our brand, our image and reputation are not very good. And this is a bit ironical. But I'm a bit concerned about uh, Kenya. They want also to emerge as an international financial center. And we know that's a big difference because they've got the capacity, they've got the infrastructure, they've got the size, they've got the scale, and there are already many GPs that operate out of Nairobi. So I think if they shape up and they create an ecosystem, and if there is Political stability, just at election, you know, they have a new president and they have social stability. I think they could compete with Mauritius. I mean, I hear many of my friends who tell me we can also cooperate. Sure, we can cooperate. You know, a master fund, you know, can be in Luxembourg and they need a drop in Mauritius. You need another drop in Kenya or in GIF. But I think overall, we are competing against each other. Let's be, let's be honest about that. What about Dubai? Do you see Dubai as a... Dubai, I mean, Dubai has been there for a very long time. So, to, to come back to India, I think many of the funds could probably go to Gift City. And that's why, you know, I've told my friends in the private sector, we need to engage with the authority to see what do we do, you know, as an IFC in order to mitigate the impact of this migration there. And again, here I make the difference between what I would call existing new and new new. What I mean by existing new, you have one fund, you want to have a second fund or a third fund. Now, because they know us, you know, they know our first name, sure. they come to Mauritius, yeah. you know, uh, we have good network with them. Maybe they will stay with continue, us. Continue, uh, even though some are telling us that we are becoming expensive, okay? But the new new, Look, they will go where they think they will get the best quality service at competitive prices, you know. So uh, I think this could happen. Then, those who choose not to do business 
in Gift City. I'm talking about India. We'll come to Africa. Then they will have various choices. They can do Singapore, they can do Dubai, they can do Mauritius, they can do Luxembourg, they can do London, they can do Jersey, I mean, they can do Infinite almost choices, everywhere. Yeah. The Chinese, you know, they love Hong Kong, they love Singapore, and they love Cayman Islands and BVI. So we will have to compete in that pool in order to have market share. So it's going, it's going to be very tough. So one is we are not moving up the revenue chain fast enough. Second, I think competition is going to hit very hard at us. And the third one are people. We don't, have, we don't have enough people in order to move up this revenue chain. So it's a big problem. And maybe we need you know, another podcast just to speak about this challenge and how can we overcome it. So I think two questions that we have to ask ourselves to come back to the challenge and the opportunities. Where will the future growth of global business come from? And second, what are the hurdles, what are the obstacles that are in the path of our growth and progress? And what can we as a country do in order to remove these obstacles? The ecosystem, the infrastructure, the tax, capital, reputation. So I think it's a set of issues that we need to address if we want to position or reposition global business to remain a key pillar of the Mauritian economy. Do you think that, well, one, government and two, the industry as a whole, are aware of the urgency of the situation? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> oh, I mean, I keep telling my friends in the industry body, and when I meet them also, what is the situation? And, and it's good to be ahead of the curve also. You know, I was saying that, you know, for three years. And people were saying, Rama, you know, it's not going to happen. I said, look, India has changed. Let's be honest with you. India has changed. And in terms of ease of doing business, in terms of cost of doing business, in terms of the ecosystem, and in terms of being a global player, hmm? India is the big country that will witness the highest growth this year, higher than China. Mm -hmm. So things are happening in India. And it's legitimate that they want to capture, you know, a share of that business that originate from them and that it's destined also for them. Joan, let's be very candid about this. So I hope our friends in the, in the private sector and also in the public sector are aware and we need to craft very fast a strategy in order to respond to this competition and also to the other issues that I've mentioned. Here, we must be careful about one thing. You know, you have two set of players in Mauritius. You have the global players and you have the endogenous players, I like this term, you know, the local players. Yeah. Okay. Now, the local players, very often they are not very big, except few of them. Hmm? The industry is likely to be dominated by the big players now. And you know what these big players? They have a footprint in many countries in the world. They have become global players. So for them, they have to sell a seamless service Globally. across jurisdiction. Whether they catch the ball in India, in Mauritius, in Singapore, doesn't matter to them. Doesn't matter. You're answering for me. Doesn't matter. For us, it does. It does. So you've got this model that is evolving now. How in the supply chain you extract value based on where the different tasks are done geographically. It's a bit like an iPad. Yes. If you know what <laughs> yes, I mean. Yes. What part is done in Taiwan, what yeah. part is done elsewhere yeah. in Latvia. Yeah. My concern is that we may be disadvantaged in this model where we become a location where some activities are outsourced to us. And Which has already the margin, started. We'll come back to that. The margin is much lower than in fun. So I'm being having this discussion with my friend. You know, I'm an economist by training. And, and you learn very early in life that when resources are limited, you must optimize the use of resources. Hmm? And I was telling a friend the other day, probably I'm a better gardener than my gardener, <laughs> but it does not mean that I should do gardening, you know? And so what we are doing now, we are diverting resources that could go into fund administration, in fund management, and this is going into basically outsourcing. Of course, we have knock-on effects, but the other one also has got knock-on effects. So we will have to address this issue. I've told that to my friends. My apprehension is that we transition instead from 
where we are to a high end of the market, we transition in the reverse and become a financial BPO. There are many people who are getting a lot of jobs from this. I mean, I know companies have got 600 people working, but the margin is very low. We know very well the pricing that is done where most of the revenues stay outside. So if you have an abundance of labor, of course it makes sense. But if you have an acute shortage of labor as we have today, it seems to me that we need to optimize the allocation of resources and we allocate it in such a way that we maximize our earning and our tax potential. So, so this is the issue that we are facing. We need to address the human capacity problem. Of course, training is important. The challenge that we are facing is that the middle end and high end are going and we are replacing them you know, at the low end with training. And this is not good, yeah. this is not good. So we need to review the ecosystem, one to retain talent, and second to attract you know, people who have got expertise and experience. So I think we are going through this transition. And you know, this is the history and the story of Mauritius. We had to reinvent sugar. And we did we, successfully. We had to reinvent textile. I think probably we need to reinvent tourism in the light of what is happening. You know, people are looking for more privacy. People shy away, you know, from mass of people at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner. So, so maybe the model also need to be tweaked. And now probably we need to reinvent ourselves, you know, as a location for global business. Mm. And I feel that is that that's not the only area where where we have to reinvent ourselves. As you mentioned, tourism. Let's speak about that a little bit. So on the surface of it, everything looks great. I've been trying to book a room in a hotel for two weeks now, and everything's full. That's good for the country. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, you know, prices are sky high. You know, everyone's happy because Emirates has added another daily <coughs> flight. Borders have opened. Everyone's happy. But I feel that that is on the surface. We are dealing with rising inflation, depreciation of the rupee, global supply chain disruption. I feel we should be more worried than we actually are. I think there are three issues here. And, and, and many people mix one with the other. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely happy that our tourism industry has recovered. We should all be happy, you know, for all stakeholders, you know whether you own the hotel, you work in the hotel, you supply the hotel, your government, you're the airline. So I think this is good for Mauritius. So I would call that probably l'effet de conjoncture. Hmm? My friends don't like the term revenge tourism, you know? <laughs> and, and, and they prefer the term, you know, that people have stayed at home for such a long time, they have made some saving and they want to travel. And I'm one of them, you know? So, I don't know when the saving decreases or when the recession hits Europe and inflation is very high, whether the law of economic gravity and financial physics will affect Mauritius. Well, so, there is a conjunction, I think, which is good. Then, there are structural issues. And some of these structural issues, you know, are being addressed, but it takes time. Like what type of air access policy you require in order to meet the objective of government and at the same time not killing a Mauritius. You know, it's a very difficult one. And I was teasing a friend you know, the other day. I say, where you stand depends where you sit. I know someone who was working at a Mauritius. He would fight tooth and nail for a Mauritius. Okay. Now he's working for government. He said, no, we don't care about a Mauritius. We care about seats in the air and how to fill these seats. So it depends, I mean, that's what I say, you know, where you stand depends where you sit. So this is a difficult one, and Mauritius is in a very painful transition period. For the moment, there's fish in the pond for both fishermen. Hmm? The challenge would come where the market will shrink, okay? And the third one is the risk of a recession in most of our markets. And if you look what's happening, for the first time, probably, we're going to witness a contraction in all the three main regions. America, America is doing it deliberately, you know, by design. You know, they want to have a soft landing. Not sure they're going to get a soft landing, but they think inflation is too high. They want to bring down inflation to 2%. And uh, 
They're trying to catch up also on the mistake they made last year. They thought inflation was transitory. Now they realize it's structural. So now they were not on the brakes. Now they're applying the brakes too much. You know? So America is going to be in a recession. Europe, I think, is going to be more difficult. Not only is it going to be a recession, they are more reliant you know, on Russian gas and oil. So they're going to be more impacted. And China also is facing Surprisingly, a, a yes. lot of trouble, especially in the real estate. So you have a situation where the three big boys or the three big girls at the same time are facing a very bad prospect. The question that everybody is asking, how long will the recession last and how deep will it be? Now, I think about 67 to 70% of our tourists come from Europe. Now, if you add Réunion, that depends to a large extent, you know, on the generosity of France, that's probably more than that. And Europe is the region that is going to be most impacted by the recession. Look what's happening in the UK. You know, I was reading an article. People who used to donate to food banks now go to food banks, you know, to receive food. Okay? And one of the first things that people will do, except for the very rich, they're going to decrease on discretionary consumption. And discretionary Which consumption is travel, travel mm. especially long haul travel. So maybe people will travel. Either they will do balcony holidays, they go to Brighton or to Blackpool, or they go to Europe. So I think next year, there's a lot of uncertainty. Right? And, and IMF has said it, the World Bank has said it, and I think up to the end of the year, it should be okay for tourism, it should be okay for the episode. Next year, I think it's going to be very difficult. If the recession bites, it's bound to impact demand for tourism, demand for EPZ and investment also. So I'm a bit concerned of the combination of inflation and recession hitting our major market, and this would have implication on the demand for hospitality in Mauritius and also the demand for EPZ. So uncertainty, risk, and uh, the big elephant in the room, how long will the war last? If anything, it has aggravated you know, yeah. and now we hear about Russia could use, I like this term, tactical nuclear weapon, you know. So that's very bad. That's very bad. So it, it doesn't look very good, and I hope they could reach some sort of an agreement to stop the war. But it's very clear that for, for the last month, there has been an amplification yeah. of basically the war and provocation by Russia. You know, they have annexed region that they have lost this week. <laughs> so, so, so I think there's a lot of uncertainty. I keep telling my friends in the private sector, there's a law of economic gravity. And if people, and there are two effects here. There's a wealth effect and there's an income effect. The wealth effect, I mean, you know that very well. People who are rich, so those who come to Mauritius, they invest in the stock exchange. The stock exchange has crashed. And people, even Bill Gates say, you know, he's less rich than before. Even Bill Gates. Yeah. <laughs> you know that. Yes. Bill Gates is not even number two now. There's an Indian who's number two. Not because the Indian is richer. It's just because the market has crashed. You see my point? The GDP of India is higher than the UK. Not because India has done much better, because the pound sterling has depreciated. So in dollar term, India is doing much better than the UK. So I think the strategy for tourism should be, you know, to continue to diversify the market uh, in order to reduce your reliance on, on Western Europe. This can be China, this can be Far East, you know, this can be Africa. A bit like Maldives has done. Exactly. And Maldives has done extremely well in diversifying away, you know, from the major market. Now, it is true that they're very near a big market, which is India. But and the I, UAE as well. Yeah. I, I think we can do much better out of India, out of the Middle East. And the strategy must be, you know, to diversify the, the footprint, the geographical footprint, in order to mitigate the impact of the recession in Europe on our tourism sector and also on EPZ and on, on investment. So there are some clouds on the horizon. You spoke about the inflation several times, and I, I just <coughs> want to ask a question on that. So last week, Bank of Mauritius increased the, the repo rate by 75 basis points points, which I think was the largest increase in 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yes, yes. Do you think that given that where inflation is mostly, I may be wrong, mostly imported, do you think that would actually compound the issue? Look, I've been asked this question by many okay. people. 
and on my WhatsApp, you know, with LSC alumni <laughs> across the world. We have had this fascinating discussion. Now, it is true that increases in the price of oil, in the price of gas, in freight rates, and supply chain disruption, as to a large extent, led to uh, inflation. But there's also an element of demand. Uh, let's be very clear. GDP today is much higher than GDP last year. And all this money that has been given by government, right, left, and center, has gone into demand. Let's be very clear. So I don't think it's 100% supply, but there's a lot of supply side in the inflation. However, you have to be very careful. The central bank can only act on the demand side. They cannot act on the supply side. They can't stop the war. If the central bank doesn't do anything, inflation is embedded. Inflation is entrenched. Expectation of inflation rise. Then it becomes more difficult to, control. to rein in inflation. So I like this article you know, by Nobel Prize winner in economics in New York Times two weeks ago. It's better to have some pain now to have a lot of pain later. Otherwise, let me make the counter argument. The Indians are not stupid. They also have the same problem. It's supply side. And yet they have increased interest rate by four times. The Indonesians are not stupid. Okay? Even the Brits have risen interest rate. And I was surprised to look at the balance of trade of the UK, how reliant they are on import, even for gas, when they have gas in the north. So all countries in the world doing the that are thing. suffering because of the dollar, the dollar is wreaking havoc in all other countries. But the only instrument mm -hmm. that a central bank has is on the demand side. Unless, unless, like the French have done, you reduce your indirect tax, you reduce your levy on petroleum, you reduce this. Then you're helping. But in Mauritius, they don't want to do it. <laughs> what you can do, so, yeah. So my argument is that, sure, a lot of inflation is driven, you know, by, you know, the shocks, you know, what's happening in the world. But what do you do? What do you do? I mean, even with the 75 basis point, I'm not sure it would be able to defend the rupee and rein in inflation. It depends on what the Americans do. Today, I mean, whatever the authorities are doing, Johan, there is no foreign exchange in the market. Yes. And there's a parallel, mm -hmm. I won't call it black market, but gray market. Done by the banks themselves, mm -hmm. where they are selling much higher than what is recommended by the central bank. And many people are using, let me try to be politically correct. <laughs> that they are disintermediating from the local banks mm -hmm. in order to get a better deal I've on the that. foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. so, so this is the issue that you are facing. If you don't raise interest rate, it's very difficult to defend the currency. Look what happened in the UK. They raised by 75 basis point. Then the Minister of Finance, you know, disturbed, I like this, perturbed, you know, the market. They could not immediately raise interest rate. You've seen what they have done. You know, there are two ways of increasing interest rate. One, you increase the rate itself. Second, you buy bonds. When you buy bonds, the price of bonds go up. And interest rate is inversely related to the price of bond, and the price of bond has come down. Had it not been for the swift intervention of, of the, the Bank, Bank of England yeah. to mm -hmm. buy bond, which is totally opposite to what they are supposed to do. They are supposed to decrease the size of their balance sheet by selling gilds. They have to do it in order to save the pension fund. You can play game with ABC but you can't play a game with the market. So, so think you think it's probably a fair decision that they've increased the rate, the Bank of Mauritius? I think they had no choice. They had no choice. Look, one of the two has to go. Either you allow the currency to further depreciate, which some people like, or second, you raise the interest, you try to defend the rupee, and try to mitigate it. Unless you flood the market with currencies, with the government, the Bank of Mauritius doesn't have a lot of money. In fact, it's bo they're borrowing money and adding this money to the reserve. And second, they're counting in the reserve money that belong to commercial banks. So it's a very tough decision. It's a very tough decision, but I think they had no choice. 
And I think they will have no choice but to continue to increase it. If other countries increasing it. And you know, it's America that is exporting its problem to the rest of the world. All currencies are depreciating against the dollar. And they want to kill the beast of inflation from 10% to 2%. But in so doing, you know, they are going to push the economy into a recession. You know? yeah. But at least the Americans are consistent. You know? They are not putting one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator. The Brits are doing this. The Minister of Finance you know, is pursuing a fiscal policy in order to increase demand. And the governor of the central bank is pursuing a restrictive monetary policy in order to control inflation. One is cancelling the other. One is cancelling yeah. the other. And this is a recipe, you know, for stagflation, yeah. where you're going to get both, both of it. Yeah. So, so I, think, I think this is the big challenge. So if you look at Mauritius today, it's inflation, the lack of foreign exchange on the market, and three, the risk of a recession in markets that are extremely important for us, for tourists, mm -hmm. for... EPZ for global business and for investment. We've spoken about the UK a few times and actually hearing the announcements of the minute budget last week made me think about Mauritius. I know the UK is not comparable in the, the tax framework, at least not comparable to Mauritius, but the announcement of the tax cuts and the, the reaction from the market made me think about a couple of years ago, the increase of the solidarity levy and the introduction of the CSG. Not that they're comparable at all, but it made me think of it. So there's one school of thought that goes you know, against the, the announcement of the chancellor that said that trickle down economics do not work. What are your thoughts on this, but in relation to Mauritius? I mean, let's, let's try to disentangle this. Huh? Mm -hmm. In the UK, there is an economic issue and there's a political reaction. The political reaction is a very simple one. Why are you so generous to the extremely rich people when 90% of the people are struggling to make ends meet and some people have to make the choice between eating E-A-T-I-N-G and heating H-E-A-T-I-N-G. So I think politically that was criticized as morally wrong. And we've seen the reaction. So this is what I would call the political angle. Because most people don't care about whether it is funded or not. The market, I think, reacted because all the fiscal largesse of the chancellor were uncosted and unfunded. What that means, that all the tax benefits that have been given were going to be funded by an increase in borrowing. And they don't like this. And that's why immediately the cost of borrowing shot up by more than 100% and the Bank of England had to intervene. So I think there are, two, there are two sets of issues. Then there's of course the big discussion and I think only the Office of Budgetary Responsibility can deliver on judgment on that. One, will the fiscal plan be effective in delivering on higher growth? And second, is it affordable? I think we know the answer. That's why the chancellor is saying that he's not going to publish the report, you know, which we will receive this Friday. He will publish the report, I think, in six weeks' time. I understand this morning there's pressure on him to bring this forward. Now, one good thing about the chancellor, whatever his pitfall, is listen to people yes. and his change. <laughs> That's the official line, at least. With humility, I've yeah. listened well, to I the people. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, here, I mean, yeah, we don't our, listen. our minister <laughs> has, not down on it. <laughs> has not deemed it necessary you know, to change. I mean, even though this doesn't make sense in the long term. So I think it's very difficult. And one of the structural issues that we face is the sustainability of the pension system. Look, I mean, you don't need a PhD in economics, you know, from an extremely good university to do this. It doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. It doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. And how long can you kick the can down the road? I mean, some people have done the maths that the CSG will have to increase to more than 20% in order to pay for pension, you know, in six or seven years' time. With an so aging population. Not, and... no, not only do you have an aging population, it's also declining. 
very often I see people don't make, it's aging and declining, you know? This year, I think will be the first year where population will start to decline. So can you imagine what's going to happen? So you're going to have fewer people that are going to work in order to pay for the pension of more and more and more and more people, you know? It's good for people who have retired, for your dad, for me, but it's not good, you know, for the children and the grandchildren who will have to work harder to pay. Or, as they are doing now, they don't stay, they live. So I think, I think, I think it's a difficult one. And uh, this comes to this issue of how do we handle this problem of capacity? Of course, you have to continue to train. But as I told you, the problem with training that people at mid and high level are living and you're replacing those at the low end. And which goes counter to your strategy of adding more value and moving up the revenue chain. I mean, second, I think we need to find solutions to attract more women in the labor force. Mauritius is one of the few countries that is an upper middle income group where the participation of women is less than 45%. In other countries, it's about 65%. I mean, there must be a structural reason why this happened. I honestly, you know, I keep telling that to some of my friends. I don't see an increase in fertility rate, you know. No. Uh, some people believe, you know, uh, we have to convince women to have more children. Tricky, for reasons that you and I know. You know, they, they go to school, which is very good. They go to university, which is very good. They have a professional career, and they marry quite late. Even though it's possible to have children outside marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite liberal on this. <laughs> but, but the point I'm trying to make that you're reducing your, the, window. the window, you know, where you can have, you can have children. And, and, and the need to balance this very difficult equation. You know, how do you pursue a professional career? How you look after your home? At the same time, how do you grow children? It's quite, it's quite difficult. So I don't think this will happen, you know? So we'll have to rely on having more women in the labor force. Technology, you know? Yeah. I'm a great believer in technology, but it's not happening fast enough. And third is migration. You know, you have to open up floodgates. The challenge when you're opening up is between economic, social, and political. You know, many Mauritians believe that uh, these people come and take the job of our children. They put a lot of pressure on infrastructure, land become more expensive. I mean, you know the litany, you know? So it's a, it's a very difficult one. So I think you need to communicate and you need to explain to people. We have no choice, but you need to make sure that there are opportunities for other people and they're not crowded out for the moment. Well, many upper middle income Mauritian and middle income Mauritian believe that they are being crowded out, you know? And, and, and that's not good, you know? This is about opportunities. You need to broaden the opportunities for Mauritian at the same time as you do it for foreigners. There are some financial institutions where uh, foreigners are being recruited even though you have smart Mauritian. So it will create, it will create a tension. It's a difficult one. I don't think there is one size fits all, and we will have to find, you know, balances, you know. I was listening to the Minister of Labor, I think, and uh, he was arguing why he's not convinced that uh, we need to recruit foreigners for the hotel industry, where the hotel industry are seeking more hands because they don't have enough people, and there have been a sort of great resignation in the tourism sector. Many of the people that have gone are not coming back. And I think we have to ask why are they not coming back? And the minister seemed to believe that the wage is too low and the conditions are not very good and that they need to improve the conditions. So it's a debate. And it's not very clear to me that uh, if you bring a foreigner, which probably you will have to, if you bring a foreigner, when you include the cost of the air ticket, the lodging that you have to give and the other perks, whether it's going to be competitive also for them. So it's, it's a very difficult one. And, and these are transitional problems that we need to address and we need to have policies on. But overall, I think we need to open up the country, otherwise it's going to be very difficult to sustain it. Yeah. Yeah. And my concern, of course, we are also concerned about the hotel industry. Look, if there is no Bangladeshi, at my bakery, I don't get bread every day, you know? So we all know that. And you go to some restaurant in the north, you know, they look like us a bit. I speak on Creole. They say, chicken, it, chicken, it, cousin. You see? <laughs> so, so, Even at the petrol station. Yeah, like, so it's yeah. happening. Yeah. Uh, you go to the supermarket, you know, you see all 
our brothers and sisters, you know, from Africa, yeah. you know, helping yeah. us. Yeah. You know, I, I presume these are students. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you know, Mauritians have been welcome abroad. You know, you go to the UK, you go to Australia, you go to France, you go to Canada, and they have done extremely well. So I think we should reciprocate. We should reciprocate, and I think it's good also for the growth of the economy. Otherwise, I don't see how we're going to grow and how we're going to become an, an economy. My concern is at the mid end and that high end of the human resource ladder, if I could call it this way. We need to consolidate what we have. We need to diversify in order to bring resilience and not rely on few sectors only. And let me be very candid. There has not been a new sector since we introduced ICT and global business 30 years ago. When I say meaningful, you know, okay, there are some, I like it, I'm not going to mention it, but it's almost invisible in the balance of trade figure, if you know what I mean. I mean, they're doing a fine job. Whereas a global business, you know, it accounts for about 8% of GDP. Almost as high as tourism, mm -hmm. on a direct basis, ICT also. So there has not been a new sector in order to bring resilience and to diversify. So you need to consolidate what we've done. Sugar seems to be doing well, except for output, it's too low, you know, and the cost also is too high. And the problem that you face, that if you don't diversify in terms of geographical footprint and product, it's going to be difficult, and third, you need to transform. What I mean by transforming is basically with the same input, you increase your output so that you move up the supply chain. And this, you need skill, you need talent, you need technology. You need people who have expertise. And we're having a perfect storm, Zoan. Let me try to explain this. Again, just to draw attention to what is happening. And I know it because I see it, you know. We have many smart people in the global business and other high-end sector that are migrating. I don't know whether the gross is greener elsewhere or there's a perception that the gross is greener elsewhere. The ultimate outcome is that they are leaving. What's your theory on that, by the way? Why are they we'll, leaving? We'll, we'll come back to that. Let me tell you the, the, the perfect storm. Second, the diaspora is not coming back. Again, because they think the grass is greener there, or maybe, this is what someone told me, there you are appointed, you are recruited, you are promoted, you are retained on the basis of your intrinsic worth, merit, competence, qualification, expertise, experience. You don't need to know the minister or the son of the minister or the daughter of the minister, whoever it is. You know what I mean. Let's yeah, be very fair. Have a no, but this is true for all government, huh? not only one particular government. So I'll give you an anecdote. You know, a good friend of mine rang me. He said, look, uh, my son has got an offer in the public sector body. What do you think? I said, but if the government changes, you know what happened, which is unfair. But this is what happened. This is the reality. Now, very often, I've learned this as a politician. They don't kick you because you're incompetent. They kick you because someone who has helped the party that has won election wants a job. So then what do you do? You know, if you have migrated to Mauritius, if you're married to a foreigner, you've got children. So what happened? So people stick. Yeah. Then foreigners who used to be in Mauritius now are leaving for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons to mention is the 40% tax. If you add the 6 or 3%, depending whether you're an employee or employee of the CSG, and then the other taxes, it comes to about 50%. Okay? So this acts as a deterrent. And it also doesn't induce foreigners to come. And we need two types of foreigners, for talent, mm -hmm. for technology, for capital, for skill. Let's be very honest in it. And let me be very blunt with If you want to have wealth management and private banking, we don't have the expertise in Mauritius. We don't have the expertise. That's, that's a fact. Okay? Yeah. If you go on a bot on the internet, probably you're better off. Hmm? Because they tell you what is your age, what is your income, what is the profile, and then they tell you you're better off doing A, B, C, D. And you know what is A, B, C, D? C'est comme le camembert. How much in stock, how much in equity, how much in alternative asset, how much yeah. in real estate and whatnot. So you need to attract these people. Second, the best way to attract talent is to bring the large, some large corporates here. Whether it's regional headquarters, whether it's regional treasury management, whether it's procurement, whether it's the law firm, whether it's uh, 
you know, you name it. So if you have this organization, but organization need people. And again, these people, they're not very happy about the 40% tax, about the solidarity tax. You know, I was listening to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. You don't have to agree with what is done. He gave three reasons why he lowered the 45% tax to 40%. And this is quite instructive. And this is first year economics. Huh? First, he said the higher the level of tax, the more incentive for people to cheat the system, either through tax avoidance or tax evasion. Okay. Fair play. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, many people are doing this in Mauritius, you know, especially if corporate tax is 15%, the other one is 40%, they do arbitrage in terms of structure. You're laughing, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, oh, I'm not saying it's my job, but... <laughs> I, I'm not saying it, but when I lower tax to 15%, I said in Parliament, the only people who are going to be worse off are tax specialists <laughs> and, and lawyers who advise people how to play the system. Play the system, yeah. So this is the first thing. Second? People work less because they think that it is a disincentive. I know people now are playing golf instead of working and they're quite smart because they say, look, I don't want to pay 40%. So I reduce the amount of work that I do. This is the second argument. The third argument is say they look for elsewhere. And you know what is meant by that? They look for elsewhere. They'll just move. So this is economics 101, if you know what I mean. They tell you that if tax is too high, these are the three things that happen. And I think this is exactly what is happening in Mauritius. Yes. And worse, I don't think MO is collecting as much revenue from this as they thought they would. And in fact, they have merged it now into the consolidated fund so that it's difficult for you to know that it is a very low Whether amount. Whether it's a success or not, yes. So I think this is about ego. We have to look at the long-term future of the country and maybe it needs to review the tax. I think it's challenge is if he moves one, what does he do with his political promise to give 14,500 to pensioners? Yeah? So, so it's a difficult one. And, and they have taken, let me be very candid, they have taken some good measures. You know, the minimum wage was very good. You know, the negative income tax, I think, was good. I think government, by and large, managed the COVID issue quite well in terms of protecting people and safeguarding life, you know. And knowing when to I think, open up as well. I think the yeah. support that they gave to industry, to individual, I think was very good. Now, whether they should have supported everybody, that's a different matter. Because in the process, you know, they have also helped some companies that had difficulties prior to COVID, you know. I don't know whether they are zombie companies or whatnot. But we are paying a very high price for this in terms of debt and in terms of depreciation of the rupee. Because he funded it to a large extent by printing money. And today, the Bank of Mauritius, I mean, sorry for the expression, is almost broke because they have no reserve, you know? And, and I was teasing someone the other day. I said, I left university, you know, I think 1979 or whatever, 40, 45 years ago. I never thought that asterisk was a numeral, <laughs> you know? And when I read the balance sheet of uh, the Central Bank last year, and last month, you know, there was an asterisk instead of a figure. So I say, look, I must, I must uh, protest to my maths <laughs> professor, you know. Didn't the teach me well enough. Did not teach me, you know, that asterisk <laughs> is a numeral, you know. So it's difficult for him, you know, and, and you feel sorry for him, you know. And uh, there's no monetary policy, you know. You try to defend look what's happening. They allow the rupee to reach about 45, 50, and then they intervene with 10 million or 15 million. Now, the tourism sector, again, all of us know what's happening. The big groups, you know, they're doing treasury management with the money that they receive from tourism to support the other companies in the sector. Or they do deal with the banks, mm -hmm. you know. Banks have become not an intermediary, but probably a broker. Mm -hmm. And third, they are disintermediating the local banking system and working with outside yeah. foreign exchange uh, brokers to get a better deal. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. And Kenya, I'll stop this, you know. And those who don't want to do this, they have resort to what we call swaps, you know. Yes. And local swaps. You know, Kenya has prevented companies, you know, to do swaps in local currency. And they have also prohibited companies that earn the foreign exchange to exchange this revenue 
outside the country. And you can see why they are doing it. Otherwise, even the tourism will do well, there's not going to be any foreign exchange. And I feel very sorry. You know, I know, I know friends. They've got their children who are studying in Canada, in France. And this is, as you know, because we were one of them. You have to pay your fees in September or yes. October. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and they have no exchange. They have no foreign exchange, you know, and uh, they have to go and shop around, you know, little amount in order to pay for the fees of the children. And they also have difficulties. So it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough. So I think we need to sort out this problem once for all. I mean, I'm going to be controversial here. Do you think maybe it's not the right time because many companies are still struggling, but do you think a windfall tax would work <laughs> in Mauritius instead of oh. having CSG for everyone. You must have read all the newspapers, you know, all these big boys are making lots of money. I mean, let's be, let's be fair, you know, look, they are recovering from a very tough situation. And especially in the hotel industry and some of the large group, they were, they lost money and now they are recovering. They are making money. Now, there will be some people who will argue you know, when they make losses, they try to socialize these losses, which is what happened through MIC. And when there is benefit, 75% or 80% go to the shareholders, you know. And, and, and that's why many people were saying that until such time that they pay back most of the loan that they have taken from MIC, maybe there must be some restriction on dividends that they pay. Mm -hmm. Similarly, some people were arguing that because you have taken money from the MIC, I think you have some sort of responsibility to supply the market with foreign exchange that you earn. I think these are fair points that must be discussed. But to be honest, you know, I mean, you need to be pragmatic and you need to be practical. They are still heavily indebted, some of them. Hmm? I think it would not send the right signal if you were to have a windfall tax. Again, windfall tax in Europe are basically on For gas companies, companies and yeah. energy companies that have made a lot of money. They have done it in France, they have done it in, in, in Germany. But I think there is an issue, a philosophical issue going forward, you know, on when you lose money, you ask government, you know, to bail you out. And when you make money, 75% of your profit goes into dividend. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the same thing you are hearing in the hotel industry. You have to look at the distribution, you know, how much goes to, how much go to the shareholder, how much go to the top end of the management, and how little go to the workers who are actually working very hard. I think these are key questions, and we need to address this. And there's another issue, you know, I, I've been talking about this for a long time, but people think I'm crazy, and I think I'm a disruptor. Mm -hmm. We have a scarcity of resources, Joan. And when you have a scarcity of resources, Economic necessity dictates that you allocate the resources in the more optimal way in order to generate growth and share the proceed of growth. Okay. Now, we have 1.3 million people. Only 600,000 are in the labor force. 600,000. Less than half. Less than half. We are probably the only country in the world that I know of, maybe they are, I know of, that there are two labor markets in a, such a small country like Mauritius. Two labor markets. Mm -hmm. Each with its own rule of recruitment, of engagement, of retaining you, of promoting you. Private and public. Yes. There's no country. So, because you have a scarcity of resources, maybe resources are not well utilized. So I think probably we should start thinking of having one single national labor market where the rules are the same. Because look what's going to happen. Because of attrition, and because of the declining population, we're not going to have people, enough people. So this issue of having lots of people and pay poorly will not be there. And we need to increase the salary of people in the public sector because one of the problems that we face, the best talents are not attracted in the public sector anymore, except probably for the judiciary. Yeah, you know? the state because, law office. Yeah, and, because uh, people want, yeah. you know, they have the ambition, you become a judge yeah. or chief justice, you know, or whatever it is. And so I hear the Mauritius Revenue Authority pays very well yeah, as okay. well. Yeah, <laughs> okay, fair enough. And, and Mauritius Telecom. So what I'm saying that maybe it is time for us to embark on a discussion on creating 
one single labor market. Cool? Now, this will help us also to address this double discrimination that we have in our labor market. There is one labor market where many of our compatriots feel they are discriminated against, and there is another labor market where many of our brightest people who do very well in Europe think that they don't get the best chance you know, to get the best job. And this is, this is cruel mm -hmm. in a situation where you have a shortage of labor. Of when you have lots of people. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know whether it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still matters because, you know, you cannot discriminate against your own citizen. Okay? So I think this is what I mean by broadening the circle of opportunities. And we have an excellent opportunity to do that. This is probably disruption, but it's coming. You won't have enough people. So you might as well use the best talent that you have in the right job. Now, this will require a fundamental shift in the thinking of both the public sector and the private sector. Yes. Because on the one hand, there is political clientelism. On the other hand, there is legacy, family business. So I think these are some of the institutional issues that we have to think. I was speaking to some people in the private sector. If you look at the model of capitalism and the model of state capitalism, it chokes out almost 70% of the population zone. Mm. Yeah. And this is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. This is terrible. And in a situation where you have a scarcity of resources. So the point that you're making that as if you know there's a deal between state capitalists and, and market capitalists. You know, one look after X, the other one look after Y. But if you're not X or if you're not Y, okay, some are lucky. You've been lucky, I've been lucky, you know, okay? Far but and few between. Those. Far and few in between. The rest have difficulties yeah. to, to, to do it. So, so both models, I think, need to be disrupted. One, you stop this clientelism and you recruit people on the basis of merit, on the basis of competence. In some cases, it happens. Eh? And on the other one, you know, this model of legacy capitalism where ownership, control, and management. Governance. All free are in one. And you exclude many people. I mean, there are some symbolic representation, okay, in there, huh? on both sides of the, of the aisle. But in a situation where labor is scarce, we are at an upper middle income country. You want to reach the status of a high income country. You must optimize your scarce resources as well, and you have to recruit these people. And that's why, you know, I tell them, okay, I'm disruptive, but you need disruption also in life, you know? And let's reform the public sector, but let's also reform the private sector. And you have the best talent in both the public sector and in the private sector in a unique situation where the population is declining. And I'm a great believer today Zohan, that there is competence, there is merit, there is expertise across our country, irrespective of A, B, C, D. And I'm sure people will know what I mean by yeah. A, B, C, D. Not sure we're ready for that yet, though. Maybe I'm being cynical or... Uh... Because some people favor the status quo because it comforts them in the zone. The public sector, because it's for clientelism, and we know that. And the other one, it's because of legacy and family-owned business. And there's no governance in either case. Let's be fair. There's no governance in either case. I like this concept of independent directive. You know? <laughs> it's, my, it's my cousin or my friend. I invite him you know, for a whiskey on <laughs> Saturday night or for a rosé on Sunday morning. And we've done it, and you're classified as independent and you can't criticize. So, I mean, this is probably a, a bit of a caricature, you know, of it, but, but there are issues of governance on both sides. However, we often criticize government more because it's public funds. Hmm? And, and then you have, you know, how this is played out, you know. Many of the papers will support one against the other, either for ideological reason or for commercial and economic reason. So we are, we are, uh, to some extent, this is another debate we can have, you know, on in society blockade. 
But I think we have a unique opportunity, you know, to disrupt the system because the population is aging, the population is decreasing. There are challenges that we have to face. Obviously, we need technology. We need to open up the country. But I think we have a unique opportunity to engage with a view to creating a single labor market that will vastly improve the cycle of opportunities for all our citizens. And they deserve this. I mean, I feel very sorry for what has happened to resistance and alternative. They lost on a technical issue. And everybody knows what was the substance, substance of, of the case. How many years as yeah. well? Yeah. Yeah. Now, nobody knows that, okay, they may have made a mistake by referring to 1968 instead of another. But all of us, in many jurisdictions, probably the learned judges would have traveled outside the perimeter of this technical mistake and deliver a judgment. I'm not criticizing, I'm just observing. Because if it is something new, but you know, they went to the Judicial Council, they won. They went to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, they won. And the political actors have not responded, you know, to the admonishment, you know, of the Privy Council or of the United Nations. And here they are. You know, they're struggling to get money in order to go and fight mm -hmm. a case that has been, that should have been solved, you know, by the political elite. Mm -hmm. That's not their responsibility. And you feel very, very sorry for them. I don't think anything will happen because the status quo benefits, you know, some people. Just like what I told you, a two labor markets, you know, benefit some protagonists. Except, you know, if you are in the 65 or 70% of the population, you have to struggle. Grandma, you, you, you're a grandfather. You, you have grandchildren. Would you want them, I mean, that's a, maybe it's an unfair question. Would you want them to be in Mauritius in 30 years' time? I would try to encourage them to come back to Mauritius. Because, I mean, we all have a commitment, an obligation, you know and as I say, pay back, because uh, Mauritius has made up who we are. And, but this does not depend on me. It depends on what they perceive will be the ecosystem then and there. And if they believe that the system is fair and will provide them an opportunities for their personal development and also to contribute to Mauritius Inc., I think they will come back. And I think all of us are duty bound to create that ecosystem for our people to come back. Because otherwise they brain drain. You know, Mauritius, we taxpayers, you know, have paid for all these people, one way or the other, you know, one way or the other, and who benefit from it, you know, the city of London, Canada, New York, Singapore, and whatnot. But you can understand, you know, I mean, this is a deeply personal decision. They love Mauritius, they miss Mauritius. They come and enjoy our beach. They come and enjoy, you know, our Gato Piment, our Dalpuri, you know, our Rugai and whatnot. They enjoy it. Hmm? Except now they can find this abroad also. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, I think these, are, these are difficult times, but they are also challenges. They are also opportunities. One of the problems that we face is that everybody thinks it's possible to have Christmas throughout the year. And that the difficult decisions are postponed or are not made. So there is policy, there is policy paralysis. Everybody in this country knows that the pension system is unsustainable. unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that we are living beyond our means when you look at the export of goods and services and import of goods and services. Everybody knows that if we want to have food security, we need to change the fiscal incentives on land and real estate development. Otherwise, if I'm a landowner, I don't pay any tax on these development. If I can sell it to outsiders for a lot of money, yeah. why would I bother, yeah. you know, to spend lots of time, lots of research to do food security? And yet food security is extremely important for Mauritius, we saw it. The same thing, you know, for renewable energy. How do you play this out? So I think some of the policy initiatives are right. The challenge is... Implementing them. It's right? The yeah. devil is in the implementation in the detail. So you have various examples on that. I mean, you look at digital asset. I think it's good what the minister has done in terms of VCC, you know, in terms of uh, tax exempt fund, and in terms of digital asset. Well, we go out and promote this. 
They have not decided on terms of the regulation what exactly can be done. They don't know whether they are taxed it, you know, as income or as capital gains. No banks, especially international banks, you know, uh, there's appetite. So basically, it vitiates the very initiative that you have taken, parce que il n'y a pas d'intendance. So, Rama, last question for you. If you were able to look at a crystal ball, where would you like to see Mauritius in 10 years? In 10 years? That's a very short horizon, you know. <laughs> I wrote a paper, I think, last year on where Mauritius would be in 50 years. But again, this is a combination of uh, wishful thinking and probably disillusion, you know. I think the next two years will be difficult because of the recession and also of inflation. We will need to bite the bullet. It's not very clear to me whether there is... There's never appetite to bite bullet, but very often you have to do it because... Short-term pain, for long you, you, you need to be responsible yeah. and you need to look at the future. If we don't do these structural reforms, increase considerably our export earnings, whether it's in goods and services, and I think one of the areas where we could do that is the blue economy. We've been talking about it for a long time. Not much has happened and beside rhetoric. This is one sector where not only we could add to the diversification of our economy, but we could also regenerate industrialization through the processing that you can do with the fish. What are we going to do for renewable energy? It's very unclear. I don't think we can reach 60% by 2030. If anything, we have gone down, you know, in terms of the share of renewable energy. And if we made abstraction of bagasse that has always been here for a very long time, the share of renewable energy is very low. Let's be, let's be very honest. The third one is in terms of food security. I think these are the areas, you know, these are the big things that we need to do. How do you add new pillars to the economic structures of the country? The other is a small one, you know. And then Mauritius as a gateway, you know, for cross-border investment from wherever it is in the world to India and Africa. And how do we overcome some of these obstacles that I've just mention. I think this is one set of issues. The second one is human capital. There's so much waste in it, Zohan. I mean, since I was minister the first time, 30% of our poor kids were not passing the CP. There has not been much improvement right. after, after so many years. What a waste it is for these young kids. Mm -hmm. And you know very well, Zohan, once you break this first initial cycle or circle of poverty, you liberate people. And the next generation, most of the time, will not go back into it. So we also have a moral responsibility for these people. And then the third one, you know, that I has mentioned, some of these institutional changes that we have to make to create a true Mauritian nation. Very often people don't give you the right reply because they think if they tell you the truth, you're not going to be happy. You know that. Bolsonaro did better than all the opinion poll predicted because some people are ashamed to say that they will vote for an extreme right person. You know that. So very often if you ask a Mauritian, are you a communalist? He will say emphatically, no. But you and I know... And the way they vote just says a completely different thing. You and I know how this play out. So I think in terms of nation building, I believe having one single market will help. You can see what I mean. Yeah? Having one single labor market will help. If we get rid of this ethnicization of the constitution, that will also help. And then, you know, broadening the circle of opportunities. I think this is very important. Large segment of the population still believe that opportunities are not fairly distributed. Forget about outcome, this is worse. You know? So I think these are, these, are, these are a difficult thing to do. If we don't crack this difficult nut, I think Mauritius, you know, will crawl in a slow lane of the motorway.
we'll do okay. But it's going to be so volatile. You know, every time the dollar rises, our GDP per capita in dollar will come down and we'll transition from an high income country to a middle income country. We keep going back know? and forth, yes. And, and yeah. then we continue to be in the middle income trap because we are also in the middle income trap. So, so I make the distinction between crawling on the slow lane of the motorway, we'll do okay. We are not better today than we were in 2019. This is only because of inflation, you know, because in 2020, it was negative 15%. Last year, we grew at about 4%. This year, we'll go at 7%. 7 plus 4 is 11. And again, my maths tell me that 11 is always lower than 15. You know? So it's only next year, in real terms, that we will go back to where we were in, 20, in 2019. You know? so, so we have to remove inflation in it. So that's my take. But the problem that the political class faces is that you've got a vision only for five years. You need to please the people who have voted for you. And very often, you know, you disregard long-term solutions that are absolutely important. And you go, you know, for short-term decision that will make people happy. So, so that's, that's the challenge that you face. So I don't know whether I'm trying to be idealistic or you're trying to be optimistic. And, and, and in the process, you know, what happened is that wealth inequality has surged and income inequality has increased. And opportunities also are restricted, as I told you, you know. Some people do well in the public sector, some people do well in the private sector. Many people don't do well in either sector. You know, it's as if there's been a unwritten agreement, you know, where you divide between economics and business and politics and social demography, if I could use that term. So I think we have to move beyond that after, what, 55 years of independence. It's difficult. And, and I always tell people, it's not difficult to grow from a poor country to become a lower middle income country because you put all your resources at work. That's easy. And Mauritius has been good in embracing policies to move from lower middle income to middle income to upper middle income. But moving from upper middle income to high income is very tough. And to stay because, there. And to stay there. Because you need good infrastructure. You need extremely good investment in human capital. You need impeccable institution. You need good governance and transparency, and you need a very smart export-led strategy. If you have dirt road, you get cold out, you're okay. But when you're competing, you know, at a high end, you need the best infrastructure. Having said that, we've done relatively well in infrastructure. Let's be very fair, except for the port. But you know, the airport has been good investment. Road transportation has done very well. We're still behind in terms of water and electricity, you know, it's quite tricky. And so, so these five things are key, you know. You need to invest in quality infrastructure, quality education, quality institution, good governance and transparency. And I think we need an export strategy. And part of the export strategy is to open up the country to talent, to technology, to capital, and to people. Thank you so much, Rama. As you said, we, we could probably go on for hours and we'd need a separate podcast just to talk about the brain drain because that's something that fascinates me. But I think we've run out of time today. But um, thank you for your time. Good.